Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Donnelly from the University of Oxford. I'm a council member of the Royal Society, and it's my great pleasure to chair this evening's lecture. Before we start, can I ask you to check that your phones are either turned off or set to silent? And can I alert you to the fact that today's lecture will be televised for the Society's archives and webcast for people to watch online uh, live? The Francis Crick Lecture is one of the distinguished prizes that the Royal Society awards each year. It's given annually in any field in the biological sciences, with preference given to genetics, molecular biology and neurobiology, the general areas in which Francis Crick worked, and to fund fundamental theoretical work, which was a hallmark of his science. The lectureship and the prize was endowed by Sidney Brenner in Francis Crick's memory. Today's lecturer and winner of the prize this year is Dr. Sarah Teichman from the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Sarah is a program leader at the LMB in computational genomics. She's made major contributions to the classification, evolution, and assembly of multi-domain proteins and protein complexes, including discoveries that improve structure, prediction, and engineering of interactions. She's also described fundamental principles of the regulation of gene expression, such as the distribution of gene expression levels in animal cells, which aid in the interpretation of next-generation DNA sequencing data. It's my great pleasure to invite Sarah to give this year's Francis Crick Lecture, entitled Finding Patterns in Genes and Proteins, Decoding the Logic of Molecular Interactions. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Peter, and good evening, everybody, and welcome to my lecture. Well done for uh, stumbling off the London cold weather into the warmth of the Royal Society here. Um, as you'll know from um, the, the advertising for the lecture, the title of my talk is Finding Patterns in Genes and Proteins. Now, this may seem like an unusual thing for molecular biologists to do because we're usually thought of as wielding sort of pipettes and test tubes and having white coats on and mixing up chemicals with cells and proteins and things like that. But actually, it, thinking about finding patterns in, in data harks back to the, the birth of molecular biology. And in fact, Crick, whose lecture, uh, who's, um, whom this lecture is named after, of course, I, predicted the double helical structure of DNA from data that was available to him. And nowadays, this activity of finding patterns is a fantastically fun activity because we have humongous genomic data sets available to us, and not just um, completely sequenced genomes, but also tens of thousands of crystal structures, information from high-throughput techniques, roboticized techniques for identifying interactions between proteins. And so it's really a, a fantastic time for people who think about molecular biological data using mathematical and computational methods. And my obsession is finding patterns in the interactions between genes and proteins. And so what you can see on this slide are, along the left-hand side, crystal structures, space-filling representations of crystal structures of protein complexes. And if you look carefully, what you can see in these um, five different colored protein complexes are little globules that correspond to the proteins. And then they're, they're actually repetitions of proteins within each of these structures. So in this orange one, there are actually six repetitions of the same protein, for instance, and, and it's the same in the purple one. And these repetitions are represented on this side in a network representation that we developed, where the balls are the proteins, and the edges between them represent the physical binding event between the subunits, between the individual proteins. And so with this kind of simplified representation, what we can do is to um, com use mathematical techniques to compare the data very quickly and identify patterns that tell us something general about these interactions between proteins and between genes. And actually identifying patterns is, a pretty, um, is, a, is a quite a common activity in science. And so for instance, the periodic table of the elements is actually a famous example in chemistry where and a pattern was identified, the, the, the rows being the atomic number and the, um, the different rows corresponding to the valence shells. And of course, this is, gives a very powerful insight into the functions of the individual elements and makes predictions about which elements are, should be present that haven't been discovered yet and so on. And in fact, it's also common in maths, 
because just a few weeks ago, a colleague of mine from Trinity College gave a talk entitled Looking for Patterns in the Prime Numbers. I, I thought the whole point about prime numbers was that there weren't patterns. But the interesting thing is that it wasn't telepathy. So both of us, um, sort of colleagues, chose very similar titles for our talks. And I think actually looking for patterns is something that's common to all of us. So all of us here are actually looking for patterns all the time in the world around us. And we're looking for patterns in our people's behavior. We're looking for patterns in the weather, which is a bit difficult in England. But um, the reason that we're doing that all the time, I think, is that it gives us a, 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 an understanding or prediction about causes, the correlations between things point towards possible causes and explanations of why things are the way they are. And it also allows us to potentially extrapolate to the future and make predictions about data that, uh, that we don't know much about, and sort of to look forward and um, um, make predictions about functions and interactions and so on. So the story tonight is going to um, go in three parts, and we're going to travel along the central dogma of, of molecular biology, which of course is a term coined by Crick for the information flow from the double helical DNA to the messenger of the ribonucleic acid, and finally to the active product of genes, the proteins. And as I mentioned, what I'm particularly interested in is the interactions between these molecules and the patterns that we can detect and the, the general principles that we can identify in the, the complex networks of interactions, because of course there are thousands of these molecules and sometimes tens of thousands in a given cell in an organism. And so um, we're going to start off looking at interactions between proteins and DNA first. Then we're going to go on to RNA and look at the distribution of um, expression levels, the abundances of these molecules. And then finally, the interactions between proteins and the protein complexes that I showed you on the first slide. So the, the three questions that I want to answer, and I'll explain what these mean specifically in more detail later, are, first of all, do transcription factors compete with nucleosomes? And this is to do with proteins binding to DNA, as I just indicated. That's the first question that I'll be asking. Secondly, once we have the answer to this, the output of transcription factors and nucleosomes sitting on top of DNA is a control of gene expression levels, and genes can be switched on or off and or uh, have expression fine-tuned at a number of different lev high expression levels. And so the next question is, what is the nature of this distribution? And that's important to understand because we use the expression levels as a readout of the functions of the genes. And finally, we'll ask how proteins assemble into protein complexes, into those little molecular machines that I showed you on the first slide um, that are very important for the functions of proteins. OK, so the first question is, do transcription factors compete with nucleosomes? How do transcription factors interact with nucleosomes? And what this means, specifically, what transcription factors and nucleosomes are is shown on this schematic. So transcription factors are an absolutely fascinating class of molecule because they are the proteins that directly read out the genetic code. So they recognize the, the um, letters in DNA in a sequence-specific manner and bind to, to motifs in the DNA. And those, those um, proteins are the little colored shapes here that are sitting on top of the red squares in the DNA. Then the nucleosomes are the yellow cylinders, and their major function is to wrap up the DNA. So you can see the DNA, the black uh, thread here, is wrapping around the cylinders like a rope kind of wrapping around a barrel. And the function of that is to compact this uh, humongously long molecule into the, the, the nucleus in the, in the interior of a cell, of an animal cell, I should say. And um, nucleosomes have, a much, have much less sequence specificity than transcription factors. They tend to sort of coat the DNA and basically compact the entire structure. And um, they, they do have weak preferences, though, where they prefer to bind to certain letters in the DNA compared to others. And um, so, so what you can imagine happening here is that there's a, a competition, um, a, a dance basically going on between these two classes of molecules. The nucleosomes on the one hand that are basically compacting the DNA and shutting down gene expression. And the transcription factors on the other hand that are recognizing these very specific elements and then switching on or off the genes. And so um, what we were interested in was the relationship between the sites recognized by the transcription factors, 
and those occupied by the nucleosomes. And um, there are this, this, there's a long history to this question that goes back to sort of the first um, transcription factors that were discovered and, and the first uh, studies of chromatin. But we have, um, we're in the lucky position now that we have comprehensive data available for almost the entire repertoire of transcription factors and the entire genomic information about nucleosome binding for the model organism Baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And it's, it's interesting, so this is actually um, the yeast that you use in baking bread. And so it's a unicellular organism, so it's not like an animal that consists of many different tissues. And that, but that unicellular organism is actually a good model for the, the gene regulation <laughs> of plants and animals. And, um, and, and so it's, it's also a model organism for functional genomics, and it was one of the first completely sequenced genomes. And so uh, we're in a very lucky position there that we have information about transcription factor binding and nucleosome binding, both in vitro, which means the pure biochemical, biophysical interaction between the proteins and the DNA, and also in vivo, which basically means the information about where the proteins bind in the living cell. Okay, so um, if we think about these two classes of molecules, then there are two sort of ends of the spectrum that we can imagine about how they interact. And I'm going to explain that in terms of basketball, because I spent a lot of time on the basketball court before I was a parent, actually. And um, you can think about this also in terms of football or handball or hockey or just pick your favorite sport. Think about London 2012 and the, the fantastic um, matches that we saw there. And so in any team sport, there's either man-to-man -man defense or zone defense. And in man-to-man -man defense, there's basically one offender trying to get past one defender. So a defender picks an offender, and they are both trying to shuffle past each other. The offender is trying to get to the basket and, and uh, score. On the other hand, in zone defense, what happens is that the defenders are basically just trying to protect the space. And so each defender will choose an area and will occupy that area. But no two defenders will occupy the same area. So they're, they're optimally spaced out, basically protecting the basket here. And so we could think of nucleosomes and transcription factors interacting in this one-to-one -one way, the transcription factors basically wanting to go for the same sites as the nucleosomes to possibly disrupt them and open the chromatin. Or we could think of the transcription factors as targeting sites that are not occupied by the nucleosomes and looking for the empty sites to, to, to go for. And what we found when we did our analysis of the in vitro biochemical data for the yeast transcription factors and nucleosomes was that two-thirds of the transcription factors show similar binding preferences to the nucleosomes. So this means that the majority of the transcription factors are attacking the sites that, the, that are occupied by nucleosomes. So that's shown in this little red schematic here. So the transcription factors are basically going for the same site. So this is the man-to-man -man defense model. So that was, that was an interesting surprise. That's, so that's the, the global trend. The same time, so for about 20 out of 140 transcription factors, the opposite applies. They're at the other end of the spectrum. They're like the zone defense, where they're targeting sites that are unoccupied by the nucleosomes. So that's this model where you've got the little square transcription factor targeting a site that's not bound by the nucleosome. And the way we did this calculation was to calculate the correlation coefficients, basically, of the, the transcription factor binding as compared to the landscape of nucleosome binding that we have from in vitro uh, data, where we just have naked DNA and the proteins are, are binding on top. So this, this in vitro sort of biophysical data tells us that the majority of transcription factors tend to compete directly with the nucleosomes. Their binding correlates with the nucleosomes. So you could think of this as, as potentially providing a, a noise filter because they wouldn't get to the DNA until they reach a certain abundance level, for instance. Okay, so what does this mean functionally? What significance does this have functionally? I've, I've just suggested one possibility to you, but we can dig further down if we segment the data now into the activities of the transcription factors as either activators switching on gene expression or repressors switching off gene expression. And so if we focus on those two classes in red and in blue here, so there's information about this in, in, a, in a database for the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome, SGD, and there's basically a collection of all the functional information for the genes at that place. So we could, it's a one-stop shop. We could go there directly and get the information um, for the functions of these transcription factors. And 
there are two other categories here that I won't talk about, but they, they fall very nicely on the same trend line. And that trend line tells us that activators are, um, so the genes that are switching on gene expression have a better correlation, are more um, conforming to this model of competition, direct competition with a nucosome, so the man-to-man -man defense. Repressors, on the other hand, the, the molecules that, that switch off gene expression, keep it off, are conforming more to the zone defense model. Okay, so you can see this distribution um, is lower and conforms more to this model where the, the repressors are cooperating with the nucosomes. They're going for the empty space and cooperating with the nucosomes in shutting down the chromatin. And, in, and so this um, supports a model of, of the nucosomes as generally repressing gene expression and the repressors collaborating with them, whereas the activators have to um, access sites that are, that are um, repressed by the nucleosomes. And this isn't, this isn't an absolute black and white rule. This is a, a trend that's highly statistically significant. And you can sort of think of this as, as distributions. So for instance, um, if we think of height in the human population, there's a certain distribution of heights. And um, let's say the repressors have a certain distribution around a mean. And um, we could think of the activators as being basketball players that are slightly shifted towards higher, taller heights and there's a population of players that are distributed around a mean that's slightly higher. Now, of course, there are notable exceptions to that. There are notable exceptions to basketball players. They can be short, but um, no, I'm not. No, okay, forget it. I was, I was making a joke about myself, but that's fine. So, um, the, the, so, so this isn't an absolute rule. There are, there are outliers, but this, these are the general trends, and they tell us about the basic principles of expression of... Uh, regulation of gene expression. So we have the intrinsic preference. Remember, this is all biochemical data. We've got the intrinsic preference of activators to be c competing with nucleosomes, and the intrinsic biochemical preference in terms of binding to DNA for the repressors to cooperate with nucleosomes. So they have anti-correlated um, affinities for, for DNA sequence to the nucleosomes. Now, um, uh, as I said, basically, uh, this, this model kind of squares uh, with, with the um, activators. You know, activators are the man-to-man the -man then, and the repressors are the zone defense, shutting down gene expression, shutting down DNA in a sort of spatial um, cooperation with the nucleosome. So the <coughs> nucleosomes are the three defenders back here, and the repressors, you can imagine, then occupying the space in between. So all of this data is, is in vitro. It's purely biochemical data. So what does that actually tell us about the, the situation inside the living cell in the yeast? Well, it turns out that when we go to the in vivo data, and this is all from um, a technique called chromatin immunoprecipitation, um, followed by next generation sequencing, where we have the, the binding sites of all the proteins in, inside the living yeast, then what we see is that when we compare the in vitro biochemical data with the in vivo data, um, it's the activators that are leading to a reorganization and an eviction of the nucleosomes, whereas the repressors are not contributing to, to, the, um, to any reshuffling of the chromatin. Okay, so this is the, the numbers are that the, there's 15% of reorganization of nucleosomal positions for activators, which is highly significant, whereas there's only 2% or so, which is negligible for the repressors. So this, this in vivo data very nicely um, squares with the in vitro data that we found, that, the, that the, the activators that are going for the same sites then lead to eviction of the, of the nucleosomes, opening of the chromatin, and a switching on of gene expression, whereas the repressors are basically going uh, directly, working directly with the nucleosomes and aren't affecting their, their binding. Okay, so the first part of my talk was about patterns that we can identify in the interactions between proteins with DNA, and what we saw was that the activators have a similar binding preferences to nucleosomes and lead to their repositioning. Now, um, all that rigmarole, all that interaction that I've described has the aim of regulating gene expression, as I said, switching genes on and off. So the output of those interactions is a certain level of the messenger RNA molecule for a given gene. And, and the level of that messenger RNA molecule can either be very high, there can be lots of hundreds and thousands of molecules 
at, at, at a steady state, or it can be very low, it can be one or two or none. So what we want to understand is what is the distribution of gene expression levels for the entire mouse or an, any animal genome in this case. So we're going from baker's yeast, from a multicellular organism now, to, to, to animals. That's the model system that we, the white blood cells, lymphocytes called T cells, are the, the, the system that we study in my um, experimental wet component of my research group. And um, we want to understand what the general nature is of the distribution of gene expression levels in animal cells. And so you might think, well, why, why is that such an important question? Well, it turns out that, um, the, that we use the RNA level as a readout of the function of a gene a lot of the time. Okay, so we're, um, it's, it's the control at this point that basically allows us to extrapolate to the activity of the protein at the end of the day. And the reason that we're, we measure this so frequently as molecular biologists using a variety of technologies, so PCR, microarrays, and now next generation sequencing, is that those technologies are very fast and cheap where studying the proteins is a lot more complicated and expensive. And so um, because we use this as a readout all the time, we, we, it's very important for us to be able to threshold and understand at what point of, of uh, a level of RNA we, we say that the protein is active or at what point we're talking about technical or biological background noise. So basically this is a, this is a question of distinguishing signal from noise. And, um, and that's extremely important to do properly um, because this is such a common technology and especially now with next generation sequencing where we can directly sequence the RNA. So just to, just to sort of formalize what I mean by the distribution of gene expression levels, if you imagine three genes, um, red, green, and blue here, <coughs> then the, the messenger, these are the genes with the little arrows at the front, the messenger RNA has this poly A tail, and as I said, <coughs> the, the steady state abundance can, be, can range from being extremely high to being one or two copies. And so... Um, if we want to understand the distribution of gene expression levels, then we want to basically know what number of genes out of the 20,000 or so in mouse or human, what's the number of genes that are expressed at very low levels with one or two copies, and what's the number of genes that are at this, the other end of the distribution. So it's a basically a, um, a probability density function. It's a histogram. And, and we want to understand that histogram. And so what you see here is a histogram, a histogram like that. That's a simple normal distribution. It's a bell-shaped curve. And that's the, the, the nature of the distribution for a unicellular organism, such as Baker's yeast that I mentioned before, or for bacteria. And the reason for that is that those organisms only have a few thousand genes, and basically most of the genes in those organisms are switched on most of the time. So there's only a very small fraction of the genome, a few tens or, or at the most a few hundred, that are at this end of the distribution. And basically the majority is in here or up here. Um, now, when you go from a unicellular organism to a multicellular organism like an animal, mouse, humans, or plants, and so on, there are many more genes. So there are about 20 or 25,000 genes at least in a human genome. And there are many more different cell types. And so in a given cell type, actually a significant fraction of the genome, maybe half or even more, are switched off. And we only use a fraction of, of, the, of the genes of our genetic information in any given cell type, in a muscle cell or a skin cell, for instance. And so um, it kind of makes sense that the, the other extreme, the other possible kind of distribution that we might see for gene expression levels is a bimodal distribution. What this means is that you, you basically have two groups of genes, two large groups of genes that are distributed around two different means. So one, we've got the, the highly expressed genes here that are distributed around one mean, and the lowly expressed genes here that are um, uh, basically a much lower sort of noisy background expression level, let's say. And this is, this is so this is, um, uh, the, let's call it the switch model. And when we, when we went into this in detail, we discovered that um, the, the conventional model, which was this normal distribution that came from the history of, of um, looking at simpler organisms and using uh, old technologies, 
didn't apply. And what, what actually happens is that you've got these two different populations that you can segment very nicely. So you've got, let's say, six or 7,000 genes that are highly expressed, and then um, another population of genes, um, uh, another 8,000 or so, that, are, that belong to this group of lowly expressed genes. And we can divide these by curve fitting and then threshold in the middle. And these guys correspond to things that are expressed at over one mRNA per cell on average in the population. So it's important to understand that whenever we do these measurements in general, we're, we're measuring the level of the gene expression from a population of cells. And we're talking about 100,000 cells or so. So this is the average from a population of cells. And, um, and so if we have lowly expressed genes that are present at less than one mRNA per cell, then what that means is that they're popping up in every fifth cell or every tenth cell or every hundredth cell. So they're sort of popping up noisily, but they're not uniformly expressed in every cell in the population. And then also in, in, with next generation DNA sequencing, which we use to quantify the RNA, there's a population left that doesn't, that uh, no matter how deeply you sequence and how much money you throw at, there's always a population left that isn't hit, um, that doesn't have any sequencing reads assigned to it. And so the question is, uh, the question that came to our minds was whether this, these genes should actually be part of this group or whether these genes actually form a separate group that have a, a function that, that re requires a genuine stricter repression. So there's absolutely no gene expression. And so one of the things that we, we've started to do to, to address this was to map the genes on the two-dimensional, in terms of their two-dimensional order, on the mouse chromosomes. So we've got each box is a gene, and the purple ones are the ones that are highly expressed in that, uh, the right-hand distribution that I showed, and the orange ones are the ones that are lowly expressed, and the yellow ones belong to that um, mysterious population that doesn't have any reads. And so the question in our mind was basically, if we just map the genes in this way, then can we see any pattern? Can we find any pattern in terms of how they're ordered? And um, basically, it was really surprising to us that... Um, there is a significant signal for the lowly expressed genes that, that are popping up once every so often in the cell population, that they're actually closer to the highly expressed genes than the ones that are completely shut down, or whether, at least that, that appear to be shut down, where there are no reads detected. So on average, it turns out that these orange genes are closer to the highly expressed genes. And so what this could mean is that there's a kind of ripple effect emanating from the highly expressed genes. And their chromatin, those nucleosomes, are basically... Um, generating a more open conformation, which leads to a spurious expression of the genes nearby. So this isn't, this isn't the, 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 the explanation for every single one of those genes, but it's one trend that we can see in the data, and that's, that's very interesting. And now, I mentioned that we're always looking at populations of cells when we do these genomics experiments. And um, so what we wanted to do was to actually get drilled down to what is really happening molecule by molecule, cell by cell. And to do that we uh, used a technique called single molecule RNA fish that, that doesn't give us genome-wide information, but it gives us information about one or two genes, or uh, we, can, we, could, we actually did it for a handful, um, at the resolution of individual molecules, individual mRNAs in individual cells. And so what's going on here is that in each of these, um, in each of these cells, in each of these round blobs here, the green spots correspond to a single mRNA molecule. And of course, you, we segment the... the um, the blobs that are larger by um, cutting through the volume of the cell. Uh, this is a projection onto one plane. And um, so what that, what that allows us to do, that image processing, and it, it's all automatically uh, processed and, and counted and so on, obviously, is that for, for say, several hundred cells, so in this case we've got 500 of the T cells that I mentioned that we study in my group, we can actually count the number of transcripts and the number of cells, the frequ this is the frequency of, of cells in this population that has those transcripts. And so the amazing thing, the really surprising thing to us was when we look at this GATA3 transcription factor, which is the key, one of the key regulators for this cell type, for the Th2 cells, then what we saw was this huge distribution of the numbers of mRNAs per cell. So instead of having, let's say, 75 mRNAs in every cell in the population, there's a, there's a lot of heterogeneity, and this is much greater than what you just expect because of the cell cycle, by the way. So from, from one to, all the way up to 350. And so it's kind of surprising that you would get a master regular expressed very lowly in these cells because they are genuinely Th2 cells. We know that. And on the other side, it's surprising that you'd waste energy to express 350 
molecules of mRNA for that gene if you only need about 75 or so to be a Th2 cell, right? So what this is saying is there's a lot of, there's very rich information hidden inside um, these, these population averages that we usually measure if you go down to the single cell level. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got um, TBX21, which is a gene, at another transcription factor for a different cell type that we expect to be completely silent in these cells. And we see in 400 of the 500 cells, it is completely silent. There are zero molecules. But in the remaining 100 cells, they, they go, that, that gene goes all the way up to 40 transcripts, right? So um, it's actually, it's not needed for Th2 cells, but it actually goes up to quite a high level. And that, that, could, there, that could harbor some interesting functional information. We're not, we don't really know at this stage. And so what this means is that um, if we had the, the possibility of going down to the single cell level and doing genome-wide measurements, a whole new world would open up to us, a whole new world of information about the nature of cells and about the nature of gene expression, because we would effectively have a new kind of resolution. And we're, we're basically on the cusp of being able to do that. So there's very exciting technological developments happening in it at the moment. And what I want to show you is a movie, but my movie... Um, didn't work inside the, the presentation, so I'm going to go to a separate file now. Um, and this is a, a machine from a, a company in California called Fluidime, where you can load cells onto a chip, and the cells are then pumped through these little tubes. Remember, each cell is the size of a pinhead, so this is absolutely minuscule. And every individual cell is then captured in a valve. So you can see the little yellow ball is captured here, then it, the others zoom on, one's captured here, one's captured here. <laughs> and so on, and that goes on for 96 cells. So this, this machine, this chip captures 96 cells. And what happens when the cell is captured is that you can then, it's trapped inside here, and you can then do things with it. You can image it in a microscope. So you can look at the 96 cells that are captured and you can image it in a microscope. Or you can actually sequence the entire genome or entire transcriptome. In other words, the entire set of expression levels and so on. And um, we're, we're doing sort of preliminary experiments at the moment, and this is one of the, the major sort of exciting things um, that we're going to go forward with when, when I move to the Wellcome Trust Genome Campus in Hingston. So my whole group is moving there. And this is one of the, um, the, the really exciting new developments um, that are coming out of an initiative there. In other words, that we can look at single cells and sequence the entire genomes of single cells. And... Um, for, for gene expression, as I showed you, this, this has, um, could reveal a whole new world because of this vast heterogeneity that we see in cells. So you can see subpopulations. We can see variations, different levels of variation in genes and so on. So what I've told you about the, the RNA level, the patterns that we discover at the RNA level in, in genomes, is that we see a bimodal distribution of the gene expression levels in animal cells. This allows us to threshold very reliably and accurately, rather than uh, choosing some arbitrary threshold, which is often done, and to identify the active genes in, in um, next-generation sequencing data. And I've also mentioned this really exciting new technology that's going to allow us to um, uh, have a whole new world and open to us in terms of cell biology and, and molecular biology of gene expression. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I've talked about DNA and proteins sitting on top of DNA. I've talked about RNA and the gene expression levels. And finally, what I want to tell you about some, some very exciting work that's going on in my group at the moment in looking at how proteins assemble into complexes. So this is where we start off in the talk when we saw these colorful complexes of proteins binding to each other. So we're, we're now in this section. And... Um, the reason that this is so important is, is really illustrated by another movie. So I'm going to show you what the inside of a cell looks like. This is a, a really beautiful um, simulation from, from Adrian Alcock where you see the inside of a bacterial cell, but an animal cell looks very similar. So, so what you see here is that these are the proteins inside the cell. They're all wiggling past each other, very exciting, and so on. But what I want you to notice is that each protein is binding to many other proteins in its journey through the cell. So um, what you can see, uh, for instance, the, the pink ones are binding to white ones. The blue ones are binding to light blue ones. Um, there are lots of proteins that, are, that have repetitions where there's, there's a lot of symmetry going on here. You can, you can sort of see that. Um, I'm trying to spot... Uh, 
a sort of ring-shaped one here, but, but that's okay. I mean, you, could, you get the point. Basically, no protein is an island. All the proteins are binding to other proteins in order to carry out their function in the cell. And um, get rid of this. Uh, and if we move on here, then in, in general, we can classify all of those complexes that you saw on the previous slide in terms of two major types. Homomers, which are, are the kind that I showed you on the first slide, where you've got multiple copies of the same protein binding to itself. And you can see here that the, um, there's a symmetry axis down here. So the green and the light blue polypeptide chains, these two proteins are identical to each other. They're identical copies. And they form, they're just two copies binding to each other. And so they form a dimer with a single axis of rotation here. Um, on the other hand, there are heteromers, which are, which are different types of proteins that are binding to each other. So uh, this protein complex consists of several different types of proteins. And interestingly, there's also a repetition of subunits and symmetry going on in this complex. So even when different types of proteins bind to each other, there's still a lot of this beautiful symmetry in the protein universe. And um, what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is past work um, where we found patterns in homomeric proteins, proteins where there are multiple copies of themselves. And the, the computational technique that, um, that we used here was to represent the proteins as graphs. So it's this where the, the um, balls or, or nodes in the graphs are the, single, the individual polypeptide chains, and the physical binding between the proteins are the edges in the graphs. We, we um, created a database for, that represents all the sort of 30,000 um, protein structures in terms of their, their complex, their protein complex uh, biological unit um, in, in a database called 3D Complex that we make publicly available. So this was really the first hierarchical classification, this database, of protein complexes rather than individual proteins or domains. And I won't go into the techniques that we use, but what this allowed us to, to uh, recognize, first of all, or identify, was the fact that the majority of proteins in, in genomes, in the protein universe, are homomers. So two-thirds of proteins are homomers, kind of way more than, than you might expect. And the, the postdoc who worked on this called this molecular narcissism. So this is Echo on Narcissus, and of course, Ovid's poem on Narcissus loved staring at himself. So proteins are narcissistic. They love staring at themselves. And um, they're also very symmetric, as I've tried to indicate. So they're very, they are very beautiful and in, in terms of their symmetry. And they're, 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 not, they don't, they're not symmetrical in terms of reflections, but they're symmetrical in terms of rotations. So you see something here that has a, a rotational symmetry sort of in two dimensions, but in proteins you have to think in terms of three dimensions. So um, it's, it, it takes a bit of practice, basically. But I'll, I'll try to explain it very simply here. And that is that wherever you see an axis of symmetry here, it's a rotational axis of symmetry. And so the homodimer that I showed you has one axis of rotation down the middle. And um, you, can, you can see it very clearly here in this tetramer, so four subunits, where the, this, this is a dimer of dimers. And this dimer is basically the same as this one here. So it's not like two Lego blocks stacked on top of each other, just to make the point. This is, this is like, um, like a high five, OK? So if you do a high five with your neighbor, don't be shy. High five, high fives, everybody. High five. OK. Well done. Very good. So um, when you did that high five, you noticed that the, the fingers of your hand, of your right hand, were touching the fingers of your neighbor's right hand. And the palm of your hand was touching the palm of your neighbor's right hand. So what that means is that the interface that was used for the interaction um, is actually the, the, um, the, the uh, they're interactions that are formed twice, basically. Um, and so to kind of explain this in terms of proteins, if we have one mutation in one subunit, so if we have a mutation in your hand, that mutation that, increase, that increases the affinity of the interaction crops up again in your neighbor's hand because it's, it's two right hands, it's two copies of the same thing. And so what that means is that in terms of, in evolutionary terms, there's a mutational benefit to forming an interface that, that's a copy of itself, where there's a, an axis of rotation uh, symmetry that's interacting, uh, where the, the same residues are act, interacting with themselves twice. Okay. Um, 
don't worry too much about that. Basically, the point is that forming these, these twofold um, symmetrical interactions like dimers is mutationally beneficial. Whereas if we have this type of symmetry here in this tetramer, that's not the case in quite the same way because, you, because these are two different surfaces that are interacting with each other. So this is like the palms of your hand contacting the back of your hand. These four subunits are going round in a circle. There are two different interfaces that are contacting <coughs> each other. So that's a bit more difficult to achieve in terms of mutations and evolutionary pathways. So when we surveyed the entire uh, universe of proteins of known three-dimensional structure, all the crystal structures that are available, what we saw was that the, the, the evolutionary pathways that crop up again and again are that you start from, from a monomer and you find that it's related to a homodimer. So this dimerization is tremendously common amongst proteins. And partly it's because of that, that mutational effect that I just described and, and that you have this benefit through the, the symmetry in the interface. And, um, and, and partly they're also by physical and functional reasons. Um, but in any case, this is extremely common. And what can happen next is that you get uh, a dimer of dimer, so a second dimerization event where two dimers interact with each other. What's a bit less common is that you form these ring-shaped structures here, trimers, tetramers, and so on, where you have a single axis of rotation. Um, and um, what can happen then is that the dimer can also form these higher order structures through these similar, same sort of trimerizations, tetramerizations, such as here. So this is three dimers going around in a circle. And what can also happen very commonly is that larger modules dimerize. So the trimer can dimerize to form the hexamer. The tetramer can dimerize to form the octamer. And we, we discovered that all these transitions are common, basically, when you look for homologies, when you look for evolutionary relationships amongst the proteins. What we found was not common were the transitions that take place, for instance, across here or across here or other hours, any other possible hours that you see amongst these sets. So the, the ones that I'm showing are the ones that are overrepresented. And what we also discovered um, was that the, the potential reason for this is that, the, the, that this, this is the way that proteins actually assemble inside the cell. So you saw that crowded cytoplasm. All these proteins are, are shuffling around. And basically, they, they need to form the correct complex very quickly. They need to come together very quickly. And so that they, they need to do that by an ordered, fast pathway. And what we identified was that the pathways of assembly correspond to these evolutionary pathways in, in, in vitro biochemis, biochemical experiments. And this was sort of foundational work for the, the, next, um, the next set of studies that I'm going to tell you now, which, which is our, our ongoing work on the heteromers in my group at the moment. So what we saw in these homomers and what we also see in, in unpublished work for the heteromers is that the order of assembly is important. So you can think of this in terms of IKEA furniture. So if any of you know IKEA furniture, Basically, it is a nightmare to assemble, okay? And imagine how awful that would be if you didn't have the assembly instructions. So here's the poor IKEA customer faced with the protein subunits, and he's trying to assemble them into the correct complex without the instructions. So he's randomly, randomly trying things, okay? And if you've got two customers trying to do this exercise together, it gets even nastier, basically. Lots of different ideas of what random assembly is. So if he has the instruction kit, and the order of assembly, then there's a much happier situation, and the protein subunits can click, click, click together in the right order. And so this has to happen, of course, in term, the protein has to be driven to do this in terms of its intrinsic biochemistry and, and biophysics. And we know that for protein folding, there are fast and spontaneous pathways that are ordered. Um, and we know this from, from right from very historical experiments by Anfinson, for instance, who showed that bovine pantry pancreatic ribonuclease assembles spontaneously. Leventhal basically um, postulated theoretically that it would take a protein longer than the age of the universe to fold properly if, if, it, um, if, it, if it tried finding the proper interactions randomly. Whereas, of course, what, what occurs is on a, on a sort of um, nanosecond, um, microsecond scale, the protein finds its native energy minimum. Um, following this funnel. And so the same thing must be true for protein complexes. In order for this complex cellular cytoplasm, in order for all these um, protein complexes to shuffle past each other, to find their friends in the, in, the, in the right way, we must have ordered, fast, and spontaneous assembly pathways, right? And so the question for us is, so we, we showed that, that, was, that you have these pathways that are ordered, and now the question for us is, can we predict those pathways 
And are they conserved in evolution? Because if they're conserved in evolution, then it means that they are important functionally. And so um, we, we showed that for homomers, um, and we're now working on heteromers, sort of these uh, larger um, assemblies of different types of proteins. As I mentioned, this, this is an example of a heteromer. And so um, what, what we, uh, the approach that we took was to describe the heteromers as graphs. Again, the balls, the nodes in the graph are the individual polypeptide chains. The edges are the physical binding, the interfaces between them. And if we cut these graphs very simply by the size of the surface, the buried surface area between these complexes, then we, then we pair away polypeptide chains step by step, and we can predict an assembly pathway. And then again, we showed with, by collaborating with Carl Robinson's group using nano-electrospray mass spec that these in, in, in vitro, these are, the, these are indeed the pathways that are taken by the complexes. The, the complexes assemble, disassemble, and reassemble along these pathways. We can detect these intermediates. And the same is true for complexes where the pathway has been described in the literature. So then the second question was, are these pathways conserved in evolution? And there, um, members of my group came up with a very neat <sighs> trick, which is to, to integrate this protein, the information from the crystal structures with genomic information about the order and position of the genes on chromosomes. And so what happens to, to genes is that they can split apart or join together. They can fuse. They can undergo gene fusion or fission. And if two genes are linked to each other, then, of course, that means that they assemble, the proteins assemble automatically first, sort of through the fact that they're covalently linked. Um, and so here's an example where you've got a urease in one, from one bacterium. It's an enzyme that consists of nine subunits, three times three. And in this bacterium, you've got the same enzyme, same, exactly the same three-dimensional structure, but that here the, these um, gamma and beta genes are fused into one polypeptide chain. And so the question is, does this, this genetic event scramble up the assembly pathway or does it conserve the assembly pathway? And the answer is that when we, when we um, take the genomic information, we collate it with the structural information, then what we see is that there's a selection pressure to conserve the assembly pathways in evolution. And so the answer to these two questions is yes, we can predict the assembly pathways, and yes, they are conserved in evolution. And so this is uh, unpublished work in, in the lab and something that we're very excited about. And so um, if we can predict the pathways, then that means that we must be able to encode them computationally. And so we've done this together with um, Sebastian Arnard, a physicist in the Cavendish, and um, using a um, formalism from complexity theory. And so if we describe the proteins as these building blocks, then we can encode a set of instructions that will give us the correct interactions between the proteins. So basically, if we have protein 1 and protein 2, and we know that the red and the blue surfaces interact, then that automatically makes this cross of a 1 in the middle and, and four twos. So you can think of the, that, that kind of principle. If we apply that, that principle to protein structures, then um, we, can, we can describe the complexes in our, our graphical representation. As I mentioned, you're, you're used to this now. But then we can use the, um, the, the, the assembly kit, the set of instructions from, in, in an informational sense, to, to describe which polypeptide chains are forming which interfaces. So here, there, there are two whites, two grays. And, um, the grays and whites each have two different types of interfaces where A interacts with B and C interacts with D, for instance. Here we've also got two whites and two grays, but the way they form the contacts are different, so we have a different set of instructions, and we can then encode that in, in vector notation, for instance. And then if we, if we describe all the graphs, all the protein complexes in this way, we can order them um, and, and identify submodules in these graphs. So what we find for 95% of the cases is that there's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry of the different types of building blocks, the different types of polypeptide chains. So there are four grays and four whites here, three grays and three whites here. And um, it's, it's easy to see that there's a module here of a gray and a white that's repeated four times and in this sort of windmill. And there's a module of a white and a gray that's repeated three times in this kind of propeller structure. Okay, and if we and so we can we can simplify down the the more complex um, protein interactions using using this kind of module deconstruction, and we can then classify all the complexes 
in terms of the, the number of subunits in, the, in this module that I've just described. So you start with one for the homomers, and then you go to two, to three, to four, and so on. And then we have the number of repeats across the, the y-axis or the, the columns. Okay, so here we've got a monomer. This is a homodimer, as I showed you. Whereas for this, for this module, there are the two different types of tetramers, the square and the linear one. For two gray and two white polypeptide chains, you have these two different graph topologies, two different types of interactions. And if we, what the, the amazing thing is that we can basically order all the, the sort of um, um, between, between sort of um, three and 10,000 protein complexes. The monomers are over here, so in total it's sort of tens of thousands. We can assign them into this simple little, peer, we call it periodic table. So we can assign them to one of these graph topologies, and we can summarize all the different to topologies of the interactions in this way. <coughs> And you may think, well, so what? But if you remember, um, I mentioned the periodic table of the elements, and the power of that organization is that it tells us something about the function of the elements and about the way they, they, they work. And what we, we've used the periodic table of protein complexes to make predictions about the abundances of the different types of topologies, and that basically pops out of the different ways that you can construct these complexes, and turns out that the topologies that can evolve or be constructed in more different ways are more abundant. So that's, that's pretty neat. And then secondly, it can also allow us to make predictions about which topologies haven't been discovered yet, but should be out there in the living world, in the natural world. And, and, and you can see empty cells of the, the, uh, in the matrix here. And so that really brings me to the end of um, the, the final section of the talk where I've, where I've um, given you some idea of the, the patterns that we can see in the assembly of protein complexes. And, and I mentioned this, the, the prediction of pathways that we've done for homomers and heteromers and, and confirmations of those predictions and the periodic table that I just mentioned about the topologies. And so we've really answered these three questions now um, from my talk, the transcription factor nucleosome code, the distribution of expression levels, and the assembly of protein complexes by identifying patterns in many different types of data sets, right? And, and so those patterns have been very instructive because they've given us information about the general principles of the way the molecules interact with each other. So just to summarize this again, we've, had, we've started from um, basketball, from <coughs> transcription factor nucleosome interaction, where the activators are like the, the man defense and the, the repressors are more like the zone defense cooperating with the nucleosomes in filling the space. And then we saw that the, the, we can identify a bimodal distribution, a bimodal pattern in the abundances of mRNAs in animal cells. And that's very useful to us for distinguishing signal from noise. And finally, I've talked about protein complexes and the way that they assemble with each other and that, that we're very excited about the fact that we can identify um, and organize the topologies into a, a periodic table in terms of types of subunits and numbers of repeats. And so I just want to end here um, by saying that this is all teamwork, okay? I, I believe that science is, is teamwork nowadays, and I've been extremely fortunate in having a fantastic team of people, of group members that have worked with me, and some of the ones that, are, uh, the ones that have contributed to the work that I've talked about here are, are listed on the left, and then also collaborating groups um, that I've been extremely fortunate also to interact with in Cambridge and in Europe and the U.S., and, and, and those people are listed here. And finally, um, thank you to the funding bodies here. And thanks for your attention. I'll take any questions. There's now time for some questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, there are a couple of people with microphones uh, in the hall, so put your hand up and we'll get your microphone. Uh, and don't start... Even if you're enthusiastic, don't start asking the question until the microphones are right. Uh, down at the gentleman at the back, and then and there's another question up the front if there's someone else with the microphone. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, my question is concerning cellular respiration and the cellular um, digestion of proteins. Okay. Um, within the cell, there are the um, uh, number of organelles, and you mentioned that some organelles are uh, protein ingesting. Um, organelles. Um, the organelles include the ribosomes, centrioles, smooth reticulum, rough reticulum, and some others too. And within the nuclear membrane itself at the centre of the cell is the um, 
the, um, the chromosomes, the DNA, and um, the other genetic makeup of the cell. Um, could you tell us, please, how, um, which are the organelles which um, ingest uh, the most um, protein, which cells require the most protein, which, um, sorry, which um, organelles require the most protein, and um, how do, does, uh, uh, within the, uh, the process of cellular um, nu nutrition, how does the protein actually get into the nucleus itself and into the genetic... Um, so, so I think, you know, I was, I was considering really the interactions between proteins in one space. So I said this is a bacterial cell and, and the eukaryotic cytoplasm is in one space. But you're absolutely right that there's compartmentation, clearly. And this is very important when it comes to protein interactions, for instance, because um, proteins that, that are um, sorted to the same compartment are, are going to see each other, and once they're in different compartments, won't. And the compartmentation also has an effect on, on concentration, of course, and on, on the, the chemical nature. So you, you mentioned, um, I think, lysosome and that kind of thing. And that's going to have a very different chemical environment to the nucleus, which is full of negatively charged DNA and RNA. And so um, thinking about compartmentation is actually important when we think about the physical binding of proteins to each other because these different chemical environments and the different concentrations that you get from the subcellular compartmentation. And so we've, we've started to work on that a little bit. And we have a paper that's um, in press in PNAS where we show that proteins actually are sort of negatively designed in evolution to avoid interacting with their partners. Um, but there's some evidence that that's, that's different in different subcellular compartments. So I think that's, that's very interesting to think about the compartmentation and the chemical nature of the protein surface. So, yeah. Um, Thanks. Gentleman at the back. Hi, Sarah. Fantastic talk. Thanks. Um, hey, Duncan. So there's many hundreds of cell types in a typical mammal. Um, I, your bimodal distribution, is that the same yeah. for all different cell types? So that's a really good question, Duncan. Um, and the interesting thing is that you know, we, we start off by looking at T-helper cells, but then because that was the data that we generated in, in my lab. But then we actually looked at lots of different um, data sets that were out there for hematopoietic stem cells, uh, embryonic stem cells, um, you name it, fly, worm, and so on. And for, for all of the, the cell types, we saw this bimodal distribution. Now, it doesn't mean that they're all identical, because and, and there could be biological reasons for that, or there could be technical reasons for that. And one of the interesting technical reasons is that um, we, we think that the purer your sample is, the more homogeneous the cell types are, the more um, pronounced this, this, these two peaks are. And the more you have a mixture of cell types, like a contamination, or you've got a mixture of different cell types in a tissue, the more um, the, the gene expression levels get squeezed into some average value in the middle, and you get towards a, a, uni, a unimodal distribution. Yeah. And then on the middle of the... Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, I just wondered if you could, if you care to hypothesize a little bit about what these uh, never-read messages are. The, the... Yeah. Um, so these, these ones, remember that they're not never read. Sorry, they're, they're only never read in one cell type. They're only not, okay, they're not read in the sense that they're not read by the sequencing machine <laughs> in your sample. And so that could, that could be because, um, so, so, so the genes that are not expressed in, or that are completely shut down in one cell type may be active in another cell type. And the reason that they are completely shut down here could either be biological, so in other words, they're detrimental to the function of the cell if they pop up, or it could just be this uh, um, kind of byproduct of, of the fact that they're in an area of chromatin that's completely shut down, far away from, from expressed genes and so on. And um, yeah, I don't have a general answer, basically. It's a, it's a really good question. I've got a sort of... Thanks. Follow up question on the uh, expression at the RNA level. I found it very paradoxical that within single cells, you looked at, say, the GATA transcription factor and you found such a huge variation in the expression level. So if we take two different plants or two different cells and we grind them up and we find one gene has an expression difference of two or three fold yeah. between two different populations, we'll often try and publish that and say that's biologically significant. 
And here you're saying within a single cell type, you actually see this enormous variation yep. of expression level. And yep. I wonder whether that's actually being filtered out at the level of the protein. So are we, do you think this could be a consequence mm. of having oscillations of gene expression mm. so that the level of the protein is evened out? Or do you think these individual cells actually have those different levels of the, the cognate protein? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Phil. Um, beautiful question. So um, we, if you think, so you can look at, at these, these kind of um, white blood cells with facts analysis. And um, actually in this review, we, kind of, we show the um, distributions from facts for different proteins for which we've got the, the, the RNA data. And so we, we can calculate the coefficient of variation at, at both at the RNA level and the protein level. At the protein level, you know, for these cells, and actually for, for a lot of facts data, you also see a huge distribution. So I don't think it's averaged out at the protein level. I think it's, it's translated, actually, and it's, it's, it's just translated to a higher level. So you've got more copies of pro, you know, you've got about 100 copies on average per RNA molecule, so you multiply the whole distribution. Um, I mean, different genes have different sharpnesses, obviously, different amounts of noise in the distribution. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's very interesting to look at and, and could be biologically significant for, or we, you know, it clearly is. We have time for a few more questions. The gentleman in the middle at the back and then on the side. Hi, so when you have these uh, heteromeric complexes, uh, do you find that the different subunits are under the same uh, expression regulatory patterns? Uh, and also, do you ever find these subunits from one complex ever turning up in any other complexes? Um, so I haven't discussed that here, but it's known from, from our work and many others that the complexes that are, that are obligate, in other words, where the subunits are always together, um, that they have a very, that they're very tightly co-regulated. And indeed, in terms of their, um, you know, in terms of the gene order and the, geno the organization in prokaryotes, they tend to be part of things like the same operon and so on. But for, for transient interactions, then they, they're, they're much less strongly co-regulated. Their, their organization in, in bacteria is, is much more um, separate and, and fluctuating and so on. The operon, the, the genetic order, the operon organization. And um, um, yeah, sorry, I can't remember the second part of your question. Oh, it was... Well, Sorry, do you um, see ever a subunit from one complex appearing I mean, in another so, complex? So, so uh, you know, at the simplest level, you, you may think not, but actually there's a lot more of that going on, I think, than we appreciate. And the, the high-throughput proteomics data, for instance, for yeast, shows a huge amount of, of um, plasticity or promiscuity of, of, of subunits in different complexes, even, even ribosomal subunits and so on. So, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot more of that out there than we appreciate, actually. I don't. Wonderful lecture, thank you. Thanks. Could I ask you a question on the last part of your talk? You assumed yep. that the structures were globular, but we know yeah. as you go from prokaryotes to right through the, I guess, the early eukaryotes through to, to mammals, you get increasing numbers uh, or increasing amounts of uh, disordered sequence. Mm -hmm. We're, we're mm -hmm. pretty sure about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very yeah. distinct change. Yeah. I just wondered how you thought that those very large regions of disorder uh, which tend to link the domains is going to affect your yeah. sort of organizational well, I think that's a great picture question, at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going through to this, this picture. So I would say for when you've got disordered, um, when you've got disordered segments... Um, the, in terms of the, the symmetry of the interactions, I would we you know, a lot of the time you still have the one to one stoichiometry, which basically means that it's going to be somewhere on this periodic table. However, there are there are um, disordered segments that can have two kind two different kinds of effects. One is that you that, that that because of their flexibility they can contribute to sort of fibro formation, and we're not considering that on this table. It's just closed symmetries. But a second is that you can actually get asymmetric complexes. So you can get sort of two, two copies, a homodimer, two copies of one kind of protein, and then one of the other. And, and um, that, I think that the, 
I don't have the the absolute numbers in my head right now, but it's it, it's quite likely that the proteins with disordered segments are enriched in that five percent of the the complexes that are not on this periodic table because they're asymmetrical, and those um, so so you get this kind of um, two to one stoichiometry, three to two, and so on, um, be, because of of the the bendability basically of the disordered segments, and. Um, um, I mean, we can discuss it in more detail later. Yeah, that's a good question. A uh, gentleman at the front. Last question, I think. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you if you'd clarify what you meant about the Leventhal paradox. So, so that's basically just a postulation that if, if you have a polypeptide chain and um, it's, it, the, the individual amino acids... Are, are trying to get towards their native conformation. In other words, the chain is folded up with all the correct contacts to form a globular structure. Then to, to find that set of correct contacts and say in a, a hundred amino acid chain, you've got you know, an astronomical number of possible pairwise interactions between those, those amino acids. That, that basically would take longer than the age of the universe. So it, that's, that's the postulate. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's basically what he was saying. Um, so in other words, there must be an ordered pathway for these proteins to fold. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. So my final duty is to thank Sarah very much for a fantastic lecture. She's opened a window for us in a really accessible way on some of the fundamental building blocks of molecular biology, the fundamental building blocks of life, in not just one, but three quite different and really important areas. She's also given us... a a great sense, I think, of the importance in modern biology of the interplay between computational work and evolutionary approaches and wet lab experiments. It was all done with a clarity and a scientific elegance that I think Francis Crick would have really approved of. So it's a great pleasure to present Sarah with a, stro a scroll and a medal to commemorate her delivery of the 2012 Francis Crick Lecture. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks very much.